I recently spoke with the famed LA Times writer, author, and teacher Ruben Martinez about this. He's covered this issue from both sides of the U.S.-Mexico border. He joined me in studio for a discussion of the topic. Here's that interview. You're the son and the grandson of immigrants from El Salvador and Mexico. When you hear Mr. Trump speak about immigrants coming to the United States, what's, what's your reaction to his initial statement and to what's happened since? Sure. Thanks for having me, Larry. I'm the proud son and grandson of immigrants from Mexico and El Salvador. Uh, I'll tell you this. I was just in a, uh, I commute from Oakland to L.A., and I was uh, doing some shopping over the weekend uh, in uh, the Fruitvale District of uh, Oakland, which is a mostly immigrant neighborhood. Walked into a little store, and there's a lot of piñatas. And you know what they looked like? They were the Donald with the hair and everything. There was a big, long line of piñatas just ready for people to smack them open and have the candy <laughs> fall out at little kids' birthday parties all over the Bay Area. Uh, look, I mean, when I, uh, my initial reaction to when Donald Trump uh, made th that statement, uh, infamous statement now, about the rapists, you know, coming across the border and, and, and them sending their worst basically up here, was we're back to the future. You know, this could have been uh, 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 certain moments in American history, some of our darkest moments in American history. The, we can go all the way back to the know-nothings in the mid-19th uh, mid century, talking about Catholics and Southern Europeans. Uh, uh, the late 19th uh, century, talking about the Irish. Uh, uh, you can go all the way back to even before the founding of the Republic and find uh, people like Benjamin Franklin, founding father, complaining about the Germans in Pennsylvania, saying, These, there's so many Germans here. What are we going to do with them? They're going to Germanize us rather than our anglicizing them, I think he said. Uh, and he, he was railing against bilingual German schools. This was in the 1760s. So it's, 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 it's a, a, like an eternal return in American politics, and it's a wound uh, that is still bleeding all this time later. How about when you get the facts wrong, though? I am told, I haven't checked this, that the crime rate among the immigrants from Mexico, legal and illegal, is much lower than the crime rate in other communities in America. That is absolutely true. That is so absolutely true. when Mr. Trump was complaining about the crime rate is actually lower. It is. And uh, th there's a reason for that. The people that are crossing the border are not looking for jobs, uh, uh, you know, mugging people or raping people. They are looking for jobs that are to be had in the service sector of the economy, in the construction part of the economy. The immigrants that we've had over the last generation were part of the economic expansion, the historic boom. Uh, it subsidized the boom to a great degree because of uh, earning low wages. And, and to the extent that uh, they've stayed on and, and kept uh, many jobs going uh, uh, and remain, remained here as consumers, they've softened the recession for us. And absolutely right that there's less crime to be uh, found in the immigrant communities. Uh, they don't want to uh, 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 get the attention of the authorities because you're going to get deported. And it's very difficult to cross that border. It's a deadly border. Who can you, can you tintype the typical illegal immigrant is how old? What kind of family? How does he get here? What kind of job does he get? Yeah, we're in the city of Los Angeles, right? Um, uh, Southern California. I would say the typical profile would be a 20-year-old woman, woman, uh, woman uh, from uh, rural Mexico or Guatemala, El Salvador. Uh, she is going to be working in the service economy, more than likely. Uh, she is going uh, to uh, be extremely energetic. She's going to be uh, a mom, perhaps a single mom. Uh, she's going to be learning English at night. She is going to be sleeping four or five hours, you know, getting the kids to school, running to the, she's taking public transportation. Uh, she is working long hours, uh, uh, sometimes physical labor, taking care of other people's kids oftentimes. Uh, and, and doing what generations of immigrants have been doing across the country, you know, it's, it's our creed, right? We're a nation of immigrants, but we're also a nation that hates immigrants. Is it hard for her to come here legally? It, it is difficult for her to come here legally. There are very few slots to be had. Um, uh, there are a lot of hurdles. Uh, there are uh, long, long, long lines in terms of who's getting in line first and years and years and years of backlogs in terms of unifying families who have some legal people on this side and people waiting to get unified on the other side. So the immigration system is a mess. On that, we can all agree. That's for, that's for sure. Now, George W. Bush 
was a leader in trying to correct this problem, was he not? He's a very pro-Mexican immigrant. He spoke Spanish. Obama has deported much more than George W. Bush did. You're absolutely right. So why are we kind of pro-Obama, anti-Bush in the concept in this country when Bush was pro-immigration? Right. Well, you remember that, that term that was used a lot during the Clinton years, uh, triangulation? You know, how Clinton would, you know, take the wind out of the Republican sails by taking one of their issues yeah. and making it his own, welfare reform. Well, th that was kind of like happening on the Republican side, and George Bush, coming from a border state, uh, and knowing and having uh, Mexicans in his family through his brother, of course, uh, had a sensibility for the issue. Uh, so he was the perfect one to open up the Republican Party towards uh, Latino Hispanic vote, and he did historically. Um, but his own party rejected it. At the ultimately, 9/11 yeah. derailed that project. Right, the, the country was different on 9/12. Immigration reform was out the window. Uh, but they weren't uh, Mexicans bombing that building. They weren't, but by extension, all immigrants immediately at that point, through the paranoid lens of post-9-11 America, became potential terrorists. So, do you, do you fear that Trump could, could win this? It would have to be, the term would be fear, wouldn't it? It would be. It wouldn't, uh, the day after an election in which Donald Trump uh, reaches the presidency, this ceases to be the United States of America. I would put it to you that way. Uh, it would not be my country anymore. It would be a, a country that recalls Jim Crow. It would be a country that recalls the Civil War. It would be a country so bitterly, traumatically divided that we, I don't think the country would recover from something like that, especially if he not just attains power, but does something with that power and moves forward with these crazy ideas. One thing I have to say, here we are in the media, uh, you know, he's kind of like our, he's the media's bread and butter, right? I mean, that's, that's part of the phenomenon. Because people watch him. Yes, and you say immigration, Donald Trump, people tune in, right? Because it, it hits a part of the American psyche that reacts. But what if we take the lead of NBC and Univision and say, you know what? Hey, this is crazy. If there was some, if there was a candidate right now for president that was invoking racist stereotypes about African Americans, uh, or, or, yeah, yeah, criminalizing African Americans. Or if there was a candidate that uh, was uh, t taking Shylock stereotypes and pushing them on his agenda, would we be doing, wouldn't we say, this is just, this is not America, you can't say that anymore. It's not about political correctness. It's about just, you know, how far we've come as a country in terms of inclusion, right? And yet, the Donald gets away with this. Uh, so I think we need to kind of like look at ourselves in the media and say, what are we doing? You know, what, what part are we playing in this? I'm not saying... Uh, no, we feast off it, right? The media feasts off it. We're feasting, it's, and it's a big... He was on Colbert, right? Just, uh, uh, and Colbert was getting some criticism for kind of throwing softballs, you know, for it. Why, the Guardian newspaper in, in, in uh, the United Kingdom, whenever it mentions uh, uh, Trump, it always has qualifiers like xenophobic, racist, anti-immigrant. It's almost always there. I think that's the least we can do, and just make sure that people understand that what he's doing is clearly xenophobic. Reminded of the Patty Shaevsky movie Network. I'm sick of it, I'm tired of it, I can't stand it anymore, and I'm railing, and that gets people angry, and they don't even know what they're angry at. Absolutely true, and it's a moment, that's understandable. And you know what, it's a global moment, because the xenophobia is in Europe, too. Right? Oh, we yeah. see it. We see it. It's a global phenomenon that has to do with that terrible global downturn that happened after the, the, the boom. We went bust, and people have not recovered income inequality. Do you think this pope can help? <laughs> so, as we speak right now, right, the pope is, is, is with us. Uh, uh, he has taken a moral leadership. I mean, there's a vacuum of moral leadership in the world, right? especially with the types of political figures we're talking about here, taking up all the air in the room. So here comes an art, the first Latin American, the first Latino pope, and is he playing it safe? Maybe on doctrine he's playing it a little safe, right? He's not saying priests can marry tomorrow. He's not gonna ordain women priests tomorrow. There's still hope, <laughs> and he would. But on climate change, this is the global leadership on climate change right now. And it's coming from a moral place, and I think that's what was missing in the debate, you know? When it was just purely an environmental issue, you know, people, uh, Republicans, for example, people could push back pretty easily. Again. Oh, that's a job killer. 
You know, uh, sorry, you know, we're not going to save those fair little critters right now. We need to save jobs. That's the Republican mantra. And it's been like that for a long time. In comes Pope Francis and says, no, this is a social justice issue. This is a moral issue. In Laudato Si, the encyclical that he published, one of the memorable lines there is him saying that the earth itself is among our most vulnerable, is among the most poor. Equating, in other words, the poor among humans to the earth herself and making you know, the, the justice for the earth herself a, a social justice issue. All right, the Latino elector in America, he's what percentage now? Uh, we're close to 20 percent. It's, it's going to be the majority. Yeah, yeah. It, it, it's uh, certainly the largest race slash ethnicity because there's all that confusion about what are we. 20 years ago, weren't they Republican voters? Uh, in, there, there was more. Uh, there was a governor in California whose name you might recall, Pete Wilson, uh, uh, Pedro Wilson, Pito Wilson, as some people, uh, uh, I, there's a double entendre there that I won't get into in, <laughs> in Spanish, what he was called because he ran a campaign very much like Donald Trump uh, 20 years ago, exactly 20 years ago. And uh, what he did in California running on uh, anti-immigrant -in sentiment during an economic downturn was ensure the Democrats would lock down state politics for generations to come. Who's our governor here today? Jerry Brown. They used to call him Governor Mo derisively Governor Moonbeam, so liberal that you know he's on the moon. Well, he's our governor now. You know, we uh, anti-immigrant politics, in other words, got pushed the state so blue it's purple. I love talking with you, Ruben. It's a great pleasure. Larry. Great guest, Ruben Martinez. Thanks for coming today. Great to have you here in studio. You can find more from Ruben by following him on Twitter under his handle at Ruben6211.